Thank you. Our next call is from uh, Argentina. It's from the province of Córdoba, El Instituto Universidad Empresa. It's La Universidad Blas Pascal, Córdoba, Argentina. Our question is the following. What strategies can you implement in order to um, fight against unemployment that is produced by the technology, by the technology's uh, role in taking away jobs from people? Dr. Krishnamurti. Okay. <clears throat> uh, whenever a new technology is brought in, there is bound to be some shift in employment. This is inevitable because new technology brings with it new skills. New skills are therefore require new training. That's where the universities play a big role. Technologies are intended to help society. It is not the intention of technology to throw people out of employment. You may recall my statement about technologies based upon South-South cooperation are more easily assimilable because they are less threatening to job creation. So we need to take the individual countries competitive strength into account and examine in what way they will be benefit from the new technologies before they launch into that. Okay, sir. Why don't I just add, I think, emphasize in particular uh, really the importance of training. Uh, that it is human skills and capability that counts in the area of uh, modern technology. Uh, that anybody really can find employment provided they acquire the techniques and skills involved in uh, the utilization of these new technologies. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we have our next call from uh, the state of Mexico in uh, La Universidad Tecnológica de Nezahuacoyotl in Nezahuacoyotl in the state of Mexico. In a, in a developing country with obsolete technologies, without any updating, how can, you how can that country incorporate into the competitive, the global market, the worldwide global competitiveness, if they have obsolete technologies? Okay. Yes, this is indeed a, a paradox. One has to begin somewhere. We cannot afford to maintain obsolete technologies all the time and expect to compete in a world which is shrinking, which is now becoming borderless. And there is a greater level of communication. There is a greater level of competitiveness. So there is a need to upgrade technology, to upgrade skills, and therefore, one has to improve the technological capabilities through a variety of sources and resources. And also, the country as a whole has to have technology policies which are conducive to competitiveness. These are measures which require a great deal of attention at all levels of industry, government, university systems. Let, me just, let me just add uh, a point. And that is, there's always a market for products produced with obsolete technologies. The only problem is that those products will not command the same kind of prices. So the idea, of course, is for you to acquire the more up-to-date technologies so that you will earn more. But you can always sell products made with very low technologies. In fact, there is a very extensive global market for handicrafts, for example. So the question is, how do you move up that technology scale over time? Uh, but there's always a role for everybody, uh, whatever the, the level of technology that they have. Thank you. Our next question should be in English. It's from Brazil. 
from the state of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, uh, the Servicio Nacional de Aprendizaje Comercial in the city of Porto Alegre in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Is there a question there? Okay, our next question is from uh, Mexico, from Baja California Sur, uh, La Universidad Autónoma de Baja California Sur in La Paz. Why do emerging countries do not promote absor technology absorption according to their economic reality instead of trying to imitate the developed countries. Dr. Krishnamurti. Yes. That is a paradox to me as well. As I said in my concluding remarks, the developing countries or the emerging countries themselves are responsible to control their destinies. If they choose to adopt a line of just transferring technology without looking at the absorptive capabilities of that country, they would be in the wrong path. They need to make an assessment of where they are and create their policies accordingly. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from uh, uh, the state of Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, it's the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, Facultad de Estudios Superior, Superiores en Cuautitlán. In Cuautitlán. Okay. Gracias. Technology transfer originates payment in payments in both countries. How could you control that through the web? This is a, another perennial issue. Uh, they have not even advanced themselves in terms of payment even within one country itself. There are security issues involved. So I don't think uh, Web has reached the stage where they could do this automatically. We have a long way to go in that process. Our next question is from Venezuela, in Caracas, it's La Universidad Central de Venezuela. Do we have the next question, please? We'll take our next question then from uh, Mexico, from Mexico City, La Universidad, uh, La Salle. Okay, now I'm mistaken. We're going to do uh, also in, Me in Mexico from the state of Jalisco, La Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara, in Guadalajara, Jalisco. Would you please elaborate a little bit more on the the relation between the tra transferred technology and the technology that has been already assimilated for the developing countries to be able to continue to grow with them? Okay. Um, transferred technology should be able to blend with the existing technologies. This is where the technology blending is important. The technology blending involves cultural integration as well. And in the process of technology blending, one has to take into account a variety of policy issues, the trade issues, the procurement issues, the resource utilization issues, the infrastructure issues. 
all these have to be in place so that the new technologies coming in can come in without disrupting the existing system. Now we're going to go back to Venezuela. We've established the connection there uh, from Caracas, La Universidad Central de Venezuela. Good morning. Uh, trans transfer of knowledge actually is a challenge that we know for the innovations of this uh, globalization and the new challenges and the changes that we are foreseeing for the 21st century. My question is, how important do you think it is to have all the universities participating as agents of knowledge and as uh, um, the agents of capital resources in these processes of technological changes. Dr. Krishnamurti. Uh, I have been in the university system almost all my life. And I appreciate your question. I, my response is very positive. I believe that universities have a very important and a very big role to play in bringing together industry and government not only within their own boundaries but on a regional basis. This is where many international intergovernmental agencies including United Nations University system which has a whole network of centers of excellence. This networking provides a synergy to the whole process and it's extremely important particularly when the pace of technological changes is so rapid. Our next question is from Mexico City. It is from La Comisión Federal de Electricidad, El Museo Tecnológico uh, México de F. The technological transfer was protected by the governments of the countries the developing countries and now it's not only been liberated but it's also imposed through globalization don't you think that perhaps this is a medium an instrument to make more powerful a very small international group and to end the governments and the public and private enterprises and with the unions in general in the developing countries and what guarantees do you offer the you the developed countries in order that the technology transfer or the bilateral agreement or multilateral agreement be be uh, respected by the developing countries especially by the talking about the US thank you uh, you perhaps would like to know that um, within a couple of years from now, the intellectual property rights issue is going to become a major concern for all countries who are going to be signatories to this agreement. When that comes into place, whatever be the country you are dealing with, the intellectual property rights issue becomes an important element in the technology transfer process. So there will be a greater awareness and a greater willingness of the developed countries to share their knowledge because they know that their rights are protected or will be protected. Our next question should be in English. We're going to try to reestablish our contact with um, Brazil. It's in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. It's from uh, 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 the Serviço Nacional de Aprendizagem Comercial in Porto Alegre, in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. In Brazil, we have elections for president in 1998. There is a possibility of changing all the actual economic situation by the end of this year. In your opinion, do you think this situation will affect the transfer, the transfer of technology and international investment in Brazil? Thank you very much. 
uh, I didn't quite get the the nature of the question. Is there an opportunity in the in the political sphere to for transfer of technology? There's elections coming up this year in in Brazil. Okay. Um, political situations do play a role in the willingness of countries to transfer their technologies to other countries. As I said in the early part of my presentation, there is a risk. And there is no risk, no gain. So the countries, the organizations which take that risk will gain as a result of the transfer that would take place. They would, of course, need to assess the possible outcome of such a political process and weigh the chances of that technology surviving the political situation in that country. Thanks for your questions. Let us begin with Module 2, in which Mr. Fekit Takuti will discuss the use of commercial diplomacy as a tool for the strategic management of our expertise. Thank you. As you learned in a previous ITC video conference, one of the most important resources for transferring technology is the Internet and related channels of electronic commerce. In the last few years, we've seen an explosion of commercial activity over this new medium. There were only some 4.5 million Internet users in 1991. By 1996, there were 60 million. And by 1997, there were 100 million. Experts in the field estimate that there will be as many as 300 million or more Internet users by the turn of the century. This is 5% of the world's population. While the concentration of this total is here in the U.S. and Canada, the professional elites in most countries are now users. This suggests that the impact of this electronic resource is already far greater globally than the numbers might suggest. Active Media and ITC, two Internet research companies, have reported that sales over the Internet amounted to two to three billion U.S. dollars throughout the world in 1996. They expect these sales to double each year and to reach two to three hundred billion U.S. dollars by 2001. Forrester Research, another market research company, believes it could reach 327 billion U.S. dollars in the U.S. in 2002. And 14 percent of all consumer purchases in the United States by 2007. The volume of consumer purchases based on information gathered over the Internet is several times as large. In one way or another, most of the estimated 300 million Internet users in 2001 are likely to use information gathered over the net in making purchasing decisions. The Internet and other forms of electronic commerce are having a major impact on the way business is conducted among enterprises engaged in global trade. It is leading to more rapid and expanded communications among all the firms involved in the supply chain from the design of a product on one end of the chain to the sale of the finished product on the other end of the chain. This improved communication is reducing product life cycles by giving producers more timely information about new technologies and shifts in consumer preferences. It is also expanding the possibility for the customization of products by establishing more direct and faster lines of communications between consumers and producers. Electronic commerce has also made it possible to adjust just-in-time delivery schedules throughout the global supply management chain. You might well think that this is primarily of interest to large global corporations in developed countries. Nothing could be further from the truth. Any firm 
that is part of the supply management chain of internationally produced goods and services will have to adopt improved information management techniques to remain a supplier. At the same time, the Internet allows small and medium-sized firms, wherever they are, to compete on a more equal footing with large firms. It does this by reducing the cost of entry, the cost of marketing, and the cost of distribution. The capital cost of entry in electronic commerce, that is, the cost to set up shop on the Internet, is relatively low compared to other conventional outlets. The cost of providing information about the product to customers is also much lower, as is the cost of selling information-based products directly to a final consumer. The Internet also reduces the consumer cost of obtaining information about the availability, performance characteristics, and prices of available goods and services. Consumers typically do not have complete information about the price and quality of goods and services they are considering to purchase. Powerful internet search programs can now help customers find the cheapest offer among a large range of suppliers in a short period of time. The overall effect of electronic commerce will be to expand market opportunities for those firms that are most nimble in meeting customer needs. There are many legal issues that will have to be resolved in order to enable electronic commerce to reach its commercial potential. Government laws will have to be altered to give legal validity to electronic contracts and digital signatures. Other issues which will have to be sorted out encompass concerns about liability, regulatory jurisdiction, taxation, protection of privacy, and security of payment systems. Until these issues are resolved, the potential economic advantages of doing business electronically across national frontiers will be offset by the risks of an ambiguous legal environment. Many international organizations and business groups are working on these issues. Anyone seriously interested in using the Internet or other channels of electronic commerce for international commercial transactions can consult the web pages of the many international organizations involved in international trade and investment, including the WTO, the OECD, UNCTAD, UNCITRAL, and the ICC. A good site for obtaining information about current rules and the current state of play with respect to electronic commerce is the website for the International Trade Law Monitor. The web address for this site has been provided to you in the appendix of your participants' manual. You will also find a link to the site at the web page for the World Trade Organization. Three other useful sites for up-to-date information on the international rules for electronic commerce are the websites for UNCITRAL, that is the United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, the ICC, that is the International Chamber of Commerce, and the OECD, that is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. UNCITRAL is working to revise the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods to bring it into line with the requirements of electronic commerce. The International Chamber of Commerce is working on guidelines for ensuring trustworthy digital transactions, known as GIDEC. Last month, it announced voluntary guidelines on interactive marketing and advertising. Next month, the ICC will publish model contract clauses to ensure adequate protection of personal privacy in transporter data flows. The ICC is also, recent, also recently released a roadmap setting out progress so far in creating a framework of global rules and outlining what governments and business each need to accomplish. The roadmap tackles one of the most troublesome issues of governance in cyberspace, 
where the dividing line should be drawn between the respective responsibilities of private and public sectors. The OECD has an extensive analytical work program on issues related to electronic commerce. International commerce on the Internet, like technology transfer and all other forms of international commerce, require knowledge and skills beyond those required of a normal business manager or government administrator. The minute you cross a national frontier, you add a political and intercultural communication dimension to any commercial transaction. We call the activity of managing this added dimension commercial diplomacy. Increasingly, the conduct of international business requires professionals specifically trained for managing this aspect of international commerce. Who all is involved in commercial diplomacy? And where are they organ located organizationally? A commercial diplomat might be a government official who negotiates with counterparts abroad on trade-related issues. This might be an official in the trade or foreign ministry negotiating a trade agreement, an embassy official explaining his government's view on commercial issues, an official in a transportation ministry negotiating a bilateral air transport agreement, an official in an environment ministry wrestling with trade sanctions embedded in an international environmental agreement, an official in the health ministry handling complaints by a foreign drug manufacturer about domestic regulations, or an antitrust official handling the international dimension of a competition problem. A commercial diplomat might also be a business executive charged with managing the relationship with foreign governments on regulatory issues related to exports or imports, the transfer of technology, or the foreign operations of the firm. It might also be a country manager for the firm or someone responsible for smoothing out internal relationships within the firm among the culturally diverse components of that firm. A commercial diplomat might also be an industry association executive who is responsible for advancing the interests of member firms in other countries, or a labor union official who is working with the International Labor Organization, or a manager of a non-governmental organization seeking to advance public advocacy objectives related to global economic issues. A commercial diplomat might even be a university administrator managing an international academic exchange program or seeking foreign government approval for an archaeological excavation abroad. As I mentioned earlier, dealing with all the non-commercial aspects of international commerce requires special knowledge and skills over and above the professional knowledge and managerial skills required of a competent business executive or government official. Many of the problems and opportunities that arise in international commerce inevitably have a political dimension. For this reason, success requires not only an ability to deal with economic issues, but also an ability to navigate political and legal channels in many different countries. This requires an understanding of foreign political and legal systems and an ability to analyze public policy issues and commercial issue interests from many different perspectives. It also requires a knowledge of the international rules and procedures that apply to international trade and investment transactions. International commerce also involves dealing with people speaking different languages, following different customs, and holding different cultural values. This requires a special ability to speak different languages and a familiarity with other cultures. In a previous ITC video conference, we explored in greater depth the kind of training that is required to become proficient in commercial diplomacy. At the Monterey Institute of International Studies, I have developed a comprehensive graduate program in commercial diplomacy. It covers both a two-year master's degree in commercial diplomacy for recent university graduates 
and a one-year master's degree in commercial diplomacy for mid-career professionals who want to polish their skills and update their knowledge.